In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is the Sunday before the Nativity of Christ, when we're nearing the end of our Advent season, our fast season that predates His birth, according to the flesh. This feast day has been called by the fathers a cosmos-saving feast, a feast that saves the cosmos. It's a celebration of the birth and the flesh of our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was born before eternity begotten of the Father, but he was born in time of a human mother, and that's what we celebrate on the Feast of Nativity. And for several days before this feast, the Holy Church will celebrate this wondrous mystery in spiritual hymns and daily services. In these hymns, we're reminded of our divine birthright, of who humankind was before the fall, and how we squandered it. We squandered our sonship through falling from grace in sin and disobedience to God. But these hymns also remind us of the restoration of our sonship through repentance, of our common spiritual kinship, and of the spirit of love and caring for one another that we should have. So we should celebrate this feast of God's boundless love and extreme condescension in becoming one of us, not in a worldly way, but in a spiritual one. So let's take a moment to ask ourselves, first, why did God become incarnate? Why did he become man while remaining God? And second, what does God's incarnation require of us? As we ask these two questions, we find the answer to the first one in the words of the archangel in what he spoke to Joseph, the betrothed of the Holy Virgin in today's Gospel reading. God became man in order to save his people from their sin. For this reason he is called Jesus, which means Savior. These are the words of the angel to Joseph to explain the virgin birth. And so it was for our salvation that the Lord came to earth and became man in order to regenerate the image of God in us, which humankind had lost when it fell from God's grace. The Eastern Church Fathers, the Fathers of the Ancient Church, put a huge emphasis on the incarnation of God as a key event in our salvation, much more than the Western Fathers. For the Western Fathers, it's all about the sacrifice on the cross. And that's true for us also. But according to patristic teaching, when he took on our nature, he redeemed humankind's very essence and nature. By becoming one of us, he redeemed us and all matter in the cosmos. Whatever is connected with him is now redeemed. So the Son of God became the Son of Man in order to make us, who were the children of wrath and eternal damnation, sons of God. In the words of the Holy Apostle John the Theologian in Scripture, in his epistle, his first epistle, he said he did this so that we should be called sons of God. So God became man that he might make Adam a God. Adam meaning mankind, humankind. That's from the prayers of the Church. And in the Orthodox Church, we believe that prayer is not a monologue of us talking to God but a dialogue of us talking to God and God talking to us through the prayers of the church. Our theology is in our prayers, in our worship. There's nothing in our worship that contradicts our theology. So this is the unutterable love of God, the unspeakable compassion of the Lord, that He, the Most Holy, did this. He deified humankind in his chosen ones. 
his elect. He cleansed them from all evil, both of soul and body. He sanctified them. He glorified them. He led them from corruption to everlasting life. He made humankind worthy to stand in the blessedness before the awesome throne of his glory. And he deified us also, made us one with God. He gave us a new birth through water and the Holy Spirit in holy baptism. He sanctified us. He made us his sons. He gave us the promise of eternal life and eternal blessings, surpassing all human comprehension. And in confirmation, in chrismation, as a surety of the future blessings he gave to us, while still here on earth, the Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts. <coughs> in St. Paul's epistle to the Galatians, St. Paul writes, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Abba, in Semitic languages, is a very endearing form of calling someone Father, almost like Daddy. And so, brothers and sisters, this Feast of the Nativity of Christ, which we're about to celebrate, reminds us that we are born of God. It reminds us that we are sons of God and that we have been saved from sin. It reminds us that we must live for God in a worthy way and not for sin. As St. John says in his epistle, his first epistle, we shall live not for flesh and blood, not for the whole world which lies in evil and wickedness, and not for earthly corruption where everything decays. We must live for what St. Peter called an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. For which the Lord himself will give you a sign, as we heard in the gospel when the angel quoted Isaiah, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. We who are preparing ourselves to meet the feast of Christ's nativity should be asking ourselves, have we preserved that spiritual birth from God which we each received in baptism? Are we always heedful of our divine sonship and the sacred treasure of the Spirit which we acquired in holy baptism and chrismation? Have we grown closer to God through faith and love, like his beloved children? Have we loved one another as befits children of God? Have we despised ugly evil, and all destructive sin? Have we loved truth and every virtue? Have we loved immortal and eternal life prepared in a land which will not pass away and to which we are called by him who now has come to our corrupt earth? These are questions which we must ask ourselves now and decide because our decisions cannot be only with our minds, but above all with our hearts and with our very deeds. We should not allow ourselves to celebrate any Christian feast without seriously considering what is its meaning and what is its purpose. What is our responsibility towards it? We must know the Christian meaning behind every feast and then the feast will become beneficial for our soul's salvation. Otherwise, the enemy of our salvation will snatch us and turn the feast of God into a feast of the flesh, of lawlessness, and so, as so often happens, and just a party. Having resolved the first question of why did God become man, we now come to the second. What does the incarnation 
of the Son of God require of us. It requires us to remember and to hold in sacred honor the fact that we are born of God. And if we have sullied and trampled upon this birthright with our sins and shortcomings, we must restore it by washing it with tears of repentance. We must restore it and renew it within us, this image of God which has fallen, and restore the union with God of blessedness, truth, and holiness which has been destroyed. The incarnation of the Son of God requires from us, above all, mutual love and humility. It requires from us that we help and serve one another. For how can we not love one another when we see the love that God showed for us? How can we not be humble, seeing such humility, such voluntary condescension for our sake from the Son of God? How can we not help one another in every way possible when the Son of God himself came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many? Therefore, brothers and sisters, let us also prepare gifts for the newborn king like the wise men. But instead of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, let us bring him the gifts of faith, hope, in love. Please bring, uh, hold your right hand cupped over your left so we can uh, drop the other in your hand.